In this episode, you'll learn how you can break free from those organizational silos and unleash the full potential of design. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hello, this is Naomi Stanford. This is episode 141 of the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden things that make the difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people and business. Our guest in this episode is Naomi Stanford. She's a recognized authority in the field of organization design She's published eight books on this topic and dozens of articles. A major challenge that many service design professionals face is that the existing organizational structure doesn't align well with the work that is required to design great services. It's hard to design beyond the boundaries of departments when you're directly reporting to the IT or sales director. This situation also limits the opportunities for collaboration with other designers who are spread out across the organization. And all this means that the organization and its customers aren't benefiting from the full potential of design. So in this episode, Naomi and I explore what you can do to still make progress even when you're faced with this suboptimal organizational structure. Our conversation takes us to discuss the role of leadership and heritage. We look into the power of bottom-up movements and organizational rebels and of course, which lessons we can take on this topic from gardening. There's a lot in this conversation and I hope that you'll enjoy it as much as I did. If you want to grow as a service design professional and enjoy exploring topics like this, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that bell icon so you won't miss any future episodes. Now, like I said, there's a lot in this episode, so make sure you sit back, relax and enjoy the conversation with Naomi Stanford. Welcome to the show, Naomi. Thank you. It's great to be here. Nice to be on the show. Uh, awesome to have you on. Uh, we're going to talk about a topic which is, I think, super interesting. It hasn't been covered on the show uh, a lot, and I think I know why. But before we give too much away, uh, let's uh, first um, get to know you a little bit better. Um, you don't have a typical service design background, but maybe you can share a little bit about uh, briefly your background and what you do these days. Oh, yes. No, I don't have a service design background in the um, sense that I think you're talking about it. Um, I do have a background in what's called organization design, which I've been working in for about 25 years now, uh, which is basically uh, thinking about organizations as a whole system. Um, and then working out how elements of the system can work together more effectively to uh, create the delivery of the strategy. Now, before that, I originally trained to be a teacher and then I worked um, for multinational corporations, for, the, for governments and so on, in various other aspects of organizational sort of theory, development, learning and growing, etc. So I've always been in that field of what are organizations doing why are they doing it? How can they do it better? And so it, it meshes a, a, a variety of disciplines, um, but mine is predominantly around the harder elements of, of an organizational um, enterprise. Mm, super interesting. I think there's so much overlap between your work and what's happening inside service design. And somehow I don't see um, that overlap being exploited yet or utilized to the full potential. So let's hope this episode contributes a little bit to that. Um, you, you've shared that you've been doing this for 25 years. You've written a lot of books in the meantime, right? Yeah, just <laughs> over the course of the years. I think the first one came out in 2010. I've just finished the eighth book and that's being published on the um, 13th of January. And it's called organization, no, it's called Designing Organizations, Why It Matters and Ways to Do It Well. Mm. And it's, it's an interesting title because I had a conversation with the publisher who wanted to call it Designing Organizations. We both agreed on that bit. But the publisher wanted to put 
and how to, ways how to do it well. And I said, it's not a how-to book. There are multiple ways of designing organizations. We don't want a prescription. And I think that's where the interplay and the interdependence with other disciplines in the design field start to come into play. There are ways of doing things. There isn't a specific how to design an organization. Mm -hmm. um... Yeah, that's that's going. That, there's a lot to unpack there, uh, so uh, we'll we'll dig into that in a second. Um, Naomi, I'm not sure if you are uh, familiar with this, but we have a 60 second question rapid fire round where I ask you five questions, and your goal <laughs> is to uh, answer them as quickly as possible, and that way we'll get to know you even uh, better. Um, are you ready? Yes, but I'm always hopeless at these sorts of things. <laughs> Just the first thing that comes to your mind. And the first question okay, I have great. for you is, what's always in your fridge? In my fridge? Well, usually hummus, yogurt, and uh, currently soya milk. I oh. am a vegetarian. All right. Um, now, you've written a lot of books, but I'm curious, which books are you reading at this moment, if any? Well, that's a very good question, because I'm reading The Every by Dave Eggers, which is fascinating. On, I don't know if you've read or the, the Circle by him or seen the film. It's basically a social philosophy, what have you, commentary on Amazon, on the major tech companies, Amazon, Google, things, but as an incredibly gripping novel. Cool. Yeah. Um, already uh, excited about that one. I'll add the link in the show notes uh, down below. Uh, you mentioned that you were uh, trained as a teacher, but I'm curious, what was your very first job? My very first job, well, it was babysitting neighbors' children when I was 14. And yeah. then I had a Saturday job in a chemist as a sales assistant when I was sort of 15. I think 15 was the earliest you could work in a shop in those days. And then for about three years, I worked in a chain store on Saturdays while I was still at high school called Woolworths, which you may know. And in old UK money, got seven and six a day, which is less than one euro in current denomination. Times change, yeah. Um, what did you want to become when you were a kid? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. remember what I ever wanted to become, but I remember being very struck by my daughter who wanted to become a circus clown. And I thought that was that was quite a good thing to want to be when you're a child, to be mm. a circus clown. Mm. I don't actually remember what I wanted to be. Hmm. Okay, uh, fair enough. And the final question, although uh, you wouldn't uh, typically say that you have a service design background, but you are familiar with service design, and I think quite well. Do you remember the very first time you heard about the term or got in touch with it? Yeah, that's another good question. Yeah, I do, because I got involved in a large government department on a massive business transformation project and and I was working there for the very first time with an entire team of service designers and, and UX experience and you know that whole cadre of people who I knew about but had never worked with side by side essentially um, and that was that was a that was a, about maybe eight years or nine years ago now and that's that's when I got that linkage between the different forms of design Mm, awesome. Uh, so good to know that uh, you're familiar, definitely very familiar with the vocabulary. Now, um, we might dig into organization design today, but that's actually not the topic that we're going to uh, unravel. We're going to discuss um, what you suggested and got me really excited is the siloed nature of design, right? Yes, it is very siloed. And in fact, as I was getting ready for this this morning, I I began to think about it in a, in a slightly different context. What, what I've come across in organizations is a lot of people have the word design in their job titles. So you can think of a whole range of them, graphic designers, UX experience designers, service designers, enterprise designers, or enterprise architects. Um, and they come in sort of all short sorts of backgrounds and, and disciplines, uh, design experience people. What's interesting in an organizational sense is they're often in different reporting lines. So some will report into IT and or digital, some will report into strategy, some will report into marketing and communications, um, some will report into PR if they're communications designers, etc. 
or brand designers, you know, logos and what have you. And so the nature of organizational charts or structures essentially puts these designers into silos. Yet when you look at the methodologies, they're, they're all very similar in their, not necessarily language, but their concepts of know who the customer is, work out what they want, test and prototype, um, all that sort of thing. <clears throat> So just holding that in your head for a second, in the, um, alongside this, I'm now doing a horticulture course, garden design and plants. And one of the things that, that the way they classify plants is through the genus, which is the larger family, and then the species. And then, so I was thinking of actually of a future blog, of supposing we thought of, instead of saying service designers or organization designers, we began with designer or design as the genus, and then the species underneath that would be designer service, designer customer experience, designer organization, designer something. And so at the higher level, you've got that much closer interplay. And then in organizational terms, if you then your organization chart was organized around the genus and not the species, um, then you could have a very different view of how design operated throughout the organization. Yeah, <clears throat> um, sounds really uh, fascinating and I can follow your way of thinking. I'm, I'm thinking with the analogy to management. So um, management is a uh, an overarching discipline and then you have like these sub divisions of product management and I, I I'm not too familiar with manage but yeah I, yeah. I see well yeah. <laughs> please please comment on that uh, okay I don't think that management is a discipline mm. an overarching discipline okay um and that's been one of my frustrations through all my years in organization and I think it's a very great pity because um in order to progress in most organizations, you go, say you are a service designer, to, to get up the promotion ladder, you then become a manager of service designers. Now, then we've lost your technical expertise as a service designer. And you may be hopeless at management, but it's only to get the promotion. And for years and years, and I have succeeded in a couple of organizations, I've argued that management could be its own discipline, as you say, but not an overarching one. And then you have a group of professional managers, and then you have a group of people who progress through, a, through technical disciplines, whatever it is, on the same level of organizational status, value, parity, pay grade, etc., as the people designated managers. And you do see threads of that in particularly the legal profession, because their legal practices, certainly in the UK, are organized by legal discipline, civil rights or whatever. And then they employ professional managers to manage the practice. It's exactly the same with medical practices in the UK. The GPs don't necessarily become managers of other GPs. They carry up on their medical discipline. And if more organizations could drop the idea that promotion is through a manager route, we'd have, I think, much higher career satisfaction because people would be able to maintain their technical expertise. And we'd have much better managers because people who wanted a promotion but weren't good at management wouldn't be foisted mm. into that role. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm going to move away from all the questions that I have here in front of me because there's already so uh, many things that are coming up spontaneously in my mind. So one of the... Um, yeah, you mentioned that it would be great if uh, design was the genesis. Uh, that's how you genus, call it. Genus, yes. Yeah, yeah. G-E-N-U-S, the genus, yeah. The genus. So um, isn't like what I'm seeing with organizations is that they, they are organized the way they are because they uh, strive to achieve a certain outcome. And that is to do things cheaper, faster, more efficient. And... Uh, 
then silos and sort of uh, division of labor becomes very interesting, while design is there to solve, in, in essence, different types of challenges. Now, do you also recognize that? And if so, uh, how do we reconcile these two things? You ask great questions. The, um, what, what, I think there's a long-standing idea that organizations, that a chart represents an organization's functionality. So an organization chart, you can imagine the hierarchy. That is fundamentally not correct, because if you start to think about how work gets done, it isn't by every day you're looking at the chart saying, oh, this is just been there. You, once you've joined an organization, you don't really look at the chart again, except to maybe find out someone's job title or something. But <clears throat> so there's a, a disability in organizations to think we're not interested in how people are structured into hierarchies when we're redesigning or designing just yet. We need to look at the how the work actually flows through the organization. And, and you can think about it in all sorts of ways, but that was where I got interested in service design, because that's much more about what is the work of the service? What service are we trying to offer end to end? And then you start to think the service we want to offer end to end goes like this. So you've got it all laid out. Now, where do we need people to do the activities that contribute to the work? Or, or do we need people? Could it be automated or could it be outsourced or whatever? So you're looking at the work to deliver the service before you ever start to think about the hierarchy of organizing them. And then, then you can start to get a much better linkage of, you do these, sort. essentially the, la the chart is the last thing that comes out of an organization design, not the first thing you think of. But the challenge we have here, and I would totally again agree with you, the challenge we have here is that organizations have heritage, at least most of them, yes. right? So. <clears throat> and I think that that is one of the, the critical issues which I think about a lot because in organizational theory there's well in, in manage or systems theory a, 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 a theory of path dependence you can only deviate from the path of your heritage by a certain amount so so Amazon could never totally convert to a bricks and mortar only company because it's already been set up as an online company. And it's very interesting that they're making experiments into bricks and mortar, but I don't know how successful that they'll be because they haven't got that heritage. Whereas something like Marks and Spencer, which is a, a originally a bricks and mortar company, is having huge difficulty becoming an online company because its path is, um, bricks and mortar and so you that concept of heritage i think is really important and people don't think about it enough because if you think in your own life of what are you inheriting from your grandparents or something and you can think of physical things but also emotional attributes and what have you now some of them are you have to keep like your emotional attributes attitudes you can try and change them but it's difficult but you don't have to keep the wardrobe that they bequeathed you in their will you can get rid of it and we we don't sufficiently think about that heritage in order to consciously decide what we want to keep and what we don't want to keep in an organization going forward and and although that sounds like a in time intensive thing to do it might give more flexibility in thinking um, why are we doing it like this? Why, why don't we abandon some of our heritage? Do, do we have to keep doing it? And I did write a blog ages ago, which is, it was very fun to write, called Horse Holding. And, and that's worth looking at because it's about that heritage. Um, because it's, a very, it's an interesting short story, but basically people firing a cannon in a war um, before they fired the cannon, they stood to attention like this. And someone said, why are you standing to attention? And they said, well, we've always done that. 
and so the art questioner said well let me go and find out why you do that because it seems completely unnecessary and it turned out that they were standing to attention because years before the sort of mechanical the sort of electrical version of cannon they had to hold a horse like this still so the horse wouldn't jump off that had been pulling the cannon to the right place and, and now the horse is gone and still that beha right, yeah. and the behavior exactly. is still there yeah yeah Precisely. there are yeah. there are fascinating experiments around that um <clears throat> so yeah heritage Let, let's uh let's try to cycle back to um the question like um Organizations are organ organized in a certain way, and uh, th this means that uh, uh, service design is uh, uh, organized around uh, species. Uh, so uh, the, the UX designer, the yeah, service designer, right, yeah. the org yeah, designer. Right, yeah. um, maybe we haven't answered the question yet or explored the, uh, the question, so what? Uh, like if, if they've been doing it for ages like this, organize, organizing themselves in this way, maybe it works or it doesn't like where's what's the consequence for design of being organized in this way well yeah that it does work up to a point i don't think it maximizes the possible benefits and value to anyone to the organization to the individuals etc and it's also very confusing to employees and i've seen that and, and potentially customers, but they don't see the back end working so much. But I've seen it and it reflects in the in the vocabulary and the language of the different species, essentially. So you may be talking about ex exactly the same type of thing. I remember when I first came across product designers and service designers, I couldn't understand the difference between a product and a service in the way that they were talking about it. And, and uh, the fact that you're talking about essentially, it's not necessarily exactly the same thing, but there isn't a common language to describe what it is you're doing that each species understands, then you haven't got something across the whole organization that is, could, is replicable. And that rep replicability is, is quite important to maximize efficiency. The sort of plug and play units, if you've designed your, plug and play unit in a in a slightly different language it doesn't necessarily plug and play into someone else's language uh, and i think a lot i don't know how much of it because i haven't examined it in great detail is about linguistic um protocols and how much of it is it is actually necessary to differentiate the types of work mm -hmm. that the different designers do now, yeah, <clears throat> and, and to, to to maybe link to that is I'm thinking you mentioned like sometimes uh, design is put into the line of marketing or communication or HR or whatever. Um, there are different incentives in those areas. And, and so next to having a different language, there's a different incentive towards a different kind of output, which I can assume also doesn't contribute to collaboration and efficiency across the board. I think that's right. And, um, and I was thinking about, you know, some specific examples on that. And um, I did some very interesting work on, on, in fact, a service design. It was actually began with a with customer experience. It was on on prisoners who moved from going to being apprehended by the police to being released from jail. How many government departments are involved in that journey? And, and where are they, those department personnel located in their organizations? And that journey, we crossed a, a very large number in the, in the um, sort of around 40 different government departments with different IT systems, with different modes of categorizing a specific customer, with different um, ways of incentivizing the employees who worked on that prisoner customer journey, et cetera. And, and each one, and you can see things coming into play like 
parts of it were outsourced, the logos were different on uniform, right the way through, it was very, very difficult to see a clear journey for that person that was of benefit to, well, the person, the prisoner, but also all the organisations involved in that journey, because it was desperately frustrating for um, people to try and find who they were looking for in a system that didn't accommodate that. Yeah, there's friction everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> Correct. Yes. And and uh, inefficiency. And we, we, as customers, we experience this daily. Like This is very nearby. We experience this like by being a customer of a bank, of any... That's exactly uh, right, yes. Yeah. I collect those sorts of experiences. And there are plenty, time. yeah. And yeah. We, our work isn't done yet um, for a long time. So... <clears throat> Like if if most organizations aren't organized in the way in, around basically a service or a journey, um, and they are still organized around, uh, in my mindset, uh, a factory line and assembly line, which is yeah. I th that transition seems to be like a, a very large leap they need to make. Are there, and I'm sure there are, ways to to progress, to make smaller steps, to to transition into this without having to ask for that major leap right away? Well, uh, yes. Um, I think there are a number of mistakes that people make. They, they're right, because most people recognize that they need to make a major leap. But then they think, oh, we'll make a major leap and we'll copy Spotify. But that is absolutely not possible going back to your heritage point you can't just pick up something and and do it there's there's understandably at some level too little reflection critical thinking time to think through what we need to change and too much pressure to um do things differently immediately with without having the upfront conversations and, and discussions and reflections on you know what is it that we're looking at how much do we need to change over what time period is it actually feasible you know we don't want to i mean people love jumping on the latest bandwagon which is again it's sort of understandable but frustrating and the um your question, are there small steps? Yes, yes, there are. If if we could encourage people to be more reflective, less impatient. And you can see some very good examples higher, the white goods Chinese company. If you look at their progression from 1985 through to now, it's a classic slow progression from a traditional hierarchy pyramidic hierarchy to what they're now calling, I think the term is a modular ecosystem of self-managing teams around specific products and services. Incredibly well done over decades. But the when I kept thinking to myself, why is this? They've had the same chief executive all that time. Taking it very slowly, having a clear view, responding carefully, and then looking at various other organizations once I'd noticed that, that longevity of CEO. The ones who are good at it, of making those huge transformational journeys, not leaps, are the ones who've had very long serving but very imaginative um, CEOs. Yeah. Um, there's another one I came across, the Best Buy guy. I think he's called Hugh Jolly, who I just noticed yesterday. Um, I hadn't known. I know Best Buy, but I, he's just written a book. And then Paul Pullman, Unilever, has taken that organisation through. There are some very good examples, but you'll see that it's a lot of it is down to a CEO who can manage, if they need to, the... The, sh the shareholders who get incredibly impatient. Look at Danone, that recent thing. Um, I don't know if you know about Danone, French um, dairy foods company. Their CEO was in, on a sustainability journey, moving Danone into being um, net zero, whatever the sustainability path they were on. The shareholders got impatient and ousted him. He wasn't getting enough profitability quickly enough. Yeah, and and um, I think if that's the uh, core issue, 
um, we could almost throw our hands up in the air and say, well, there's nothing we can change here. Like it's up to leadership and to the CEO. And we are in a capitalist environment where profit, short term profit uh, rules all. So should we just uh, accept that this is the situation and wait uh, till the right CEO is appointed? Right. <laughs> Sometimes I think that, and then I think, no, don't think that. The, um, I did write my blog this week. It's called um, The Right Word on how do we encourage. Well, the word in the blog is a question about the word rebel. And there are two interesting organizations, um, corporate rebels and rebels at work, which are asking sort of those questions. And there may be others. Those are two that I know about that. But they both use the word rebel. And last week I was with a group of leaders or the week before, I think, um, a group of leaders, senior leaders. And I said, if you and they were and you'll see it in the reflect in the blog, they were sort of frustrated by all these things you're talking about. And I said, well, you are the leaders. What what are you going to do? And they said, are you inciting us to rebellion? And, and I thought, well, I'm not really. I'm just asking them if they're the leaders and they're frustrated, what is their responsibility and what actions are they going to take to relieve their frustration and benefit the organization? And I'm still, I, the blog starts to ask that question and a couple of people have thrown in comments. I still don't know the answer to that. Mm. Um, but the, or the, probably there isn't like an answer in any event, but the, I think there's a lot of societal pressure and organizations are very good at trying to encourage people to conform to what they think is a good corporate citizen. And so as soon as they see a, someone who's outside of that mold, no matter how many times they say we want diversity, inclusion and equality, there's a massive disconnect. You know, diversity and inclusion doesn't necessarily include the people you don't want in the organisation. It, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, I don't, I think there's quite a lot of hope in the smaller seed organizations. I'm doing some work currently with um, tech startups and, and how they're setting about things. I, I think there are ways of changing things. I don't need, think we need to feel utterly despondent the whole time, but it is a, quite a hev heavy challenge. And what you mentioned there is might, might be the thing uh, where we can find the most hope that you have to take into account the heritage of your organization and the type of your organization. So if you are a service designer and you are stuck in the IT department and the organization is 70,000 people big, don't expect that things will be different next year or in two years or in three years. Well, if you're at a small startup or family run business, you might be able to actually create significant change and change the situation in a much shorter time. So uh, I think you mentioned reflection. It also, also comes down to what do you want as a professional and how patient That's are exactly you? exactly right. Yes, it's your patience. And again, many years ago, but I was heavily influenced by it, I read a book called The Tempered Radical. And it's about how... Uh, one person in an organization can make a huge difference if they are very patient and just keep nibbling away at it and don't get spat out by the organization and aren't too vocal from the, the um, from their own job and and it takes a certain amount of bravery but one of the examples in the in the book was um, this was eight years ago, so you know, be aware of this example. There was one black guy who was a recruiter, and he was the only black guy at that time in the HR department. And he noticed it's a very white organization. And he made it his, mess, his um, sort of mission as a recruiter to get more people, black people, into the organization. And just by dint of from his job, selecting types of people who were, gave a better mix, he managed to show the 
increase the diversity. And then people started to notice what he was doing. And because of that time, by that stage, there was a sort of beginning to be a groundswell of we must be more diverse. He was able to capitalize on that wave. And now he's very senior in, you know, the diversity and recruitment of um, different individuals and inclusion and what have you. And, and so your method of changing the organization, which is picked up in the every, which is why this is such an incredibly interesting book, the Dave Eggers one I mentioned, the bit I'm at now, I'm not finished yet, is shall I be an internal rebel and try and bring down the organization from the inside? Or shall I be an external um, politician and try and bring it down from external forces? And because what she's trying to do, the protag main protagonist, is bring down this massive tech firm for, for various reasons, which are well explained in the book. But that is the kind of dilemma if you want to change things. What is your method of doing it? And in fact, the discussion I was, I was reading in the book yesterday was she's talking to an, a fellow sort of um, rebel. She's very impatient. He said, shall we just take more time over this? And, and you've got that wonderful discussion of how you become a rebel in an organization. Mm. In mm. All, as a, all as a well told fiction. Although my guess is, I don't know where Dave Eggers has worked, is he has seen this all in day to day operation yeah. in a real organization. Yeah. Um. I want to circle back quickly to you mentioned groundswell, and I think that's an interesting term and something that I've also been uh, seeing within organizations. So if you focus on the people who are trying to change things, things from the inside, you you see things like uh, uh, people starting a movement, like forming bonds, uh, slowly but surely creating a groundswell. I'm interested in your take on. What, I, what I've seen is that those groundswells reach a certain level. They, they reach a certain uh, passion, people who with the same energy find each other, and then they reach a level where the organization starts to, uh, the organization starts to pull them back into what is the uh, equilibrium. That's the moment I think leadership needs to step in. Or I, I'm, I'm curious what your experience is with, with, with those kind of situations. Yes, I completely agree with you. And I have a nice little slide, written uh, graphic, developed by a woman called uh, Margaret Hagen, who runs Open Law Blog, and she's trying to change the way the legal profession is designed, or Open Law. She writes a blog, and and she's got a very compelling case for building a movement, as you've said, and then getting a mandate and you need both so you need a combination of mandate and movement and what's in the book that i've just is going to be published in january i've got a, a small case study of um, google and i think also amazon of and their relationship to union organization in their organizations and in both those cases there's been a movement towards unionization or, or labor um, you know, co collectivity. But in both cases, they couldn't get the organizational leadership mandate. However, they then got external um, legal representation and what have you. Both organizations are, Google has already now got, it's not a union, but it is a labor collective which management is recognizing. And Amazon, the case is, I think, still going through, but they're very, very close now to getting union recognition from, from the mandate. So, so they've, over time, you can get the mandate because leaders do eventually see they may have to change their minds. Um, and then if you can get one or two leaders who are supportive and then work with that, and that's in the O'Deal blog that you mentioned that I've, um, writing that's that's the pe one of the pieces i've taken up we've we're building a movement we need to get the mandate and the in the last the blog three the two leaders who she thinks she'll get the mandate from are 
mentioned. Um, so the question is, now I'm writing the fourth blog, is does she get the mandate or not? <laughs> well, what? yeah, the question is what happens usually? And I think it's not um, that easy uh, because, uh, again, if we come back to incentives, um, most leadership uh, doesn't have the incentive to uh, create change. Uh, most leadership isn't about leadership at all. And I'm generalizing here. Uh, sorry for the leaders or the managers who are leaders. <laughs> but most leaders are managers, not leaders. And then you come into taking uh, things about courage, bravery, like you mentioned. Right. Um, but it is about finding uh, those right uh, leaders within your organization. And uh, so one more thing to add to this. I think the, um, the message I'm getting out of this story is... You have to do it. Like if you're a service designer feeling isolated or feeling siloed, uh, the change has to start with you. Don't wait uh, or don't hope till that CEO with a vision and a, a longevity within the organization comes in. It start. It has to start with you. I think that's a very powerful message and I completely believe it. And that's what I am always urging people to do. What are you going to do? And you can see it. I mean, in my street, there's a lot of litter. And um, so I'm going out every day with my litter picker and picking it up. And, and the neighbours are saying, oh, good for you. You're picking up litter. And I think, well, why aren't they picking up litter too? The, um, it, uh, who knows whether they're the ones dropping it. But, but each action does begin with somebody having that will, essentially. And sometimes it takes courage, but sometimes it's just I take responsibility to make a small difference and it can be very small but i also believe that a small difference can have huge unknown implications into the future it's sort of like throwing you know the ripple effect or the butterfly wing or any of those things you don't necessarily see the response immediately um, and but it does take a the will and b a certain amount of organizational courage because in an organization if you're worried about losing your job if you're worried about um, what your uh, co-workers will say about you if you're worried that you'll get um, a poor performance review etc then it's going to be much harder for you and you need to form some form of support group i, I did write another blog called um, brave design um, about how you could actually get in your point about incentives is really well made. The right incentives to encourage measured bravery, not mad risk taking, but the you know sensible bravery that is is challenging and respected, and um, there are forums for it and so on. I, I'm thinking while you're uh, sharing this. Um, so, uh, if we go back to the situation, you're a service designer, you're too isolated. You see that you need to connect with other design disciplines, other disciplines uh, within the organization to work from a service perspective rather than a product perspective. Um, and you see the opportunity to, I don't know, create a community of practice or create bonds. That's right. Um, one, you should do it. But two, I think you should have the conversation with your direct report with your boss manager whoever you're reporting to and have the conversation about uh, where you share i'm think i'm thinking about starting this community i think this will benefit the organization would i be appreciated when i do that because um coming back to the incentives you you want people to recognize that this is the right step for the organization rather than it's something uh, that it's a passion project for you. So I think the, se the conversation is, is key. I think that's a really good point. And couching the conversation in a way that shows the organizational benefits, not the benefits to you. Um, and one of, the, one of the successes I had in um, one of the organizations I was in, we at that point employed a lot of external consultants. And I've, I felt that the to do design work, they were all using different languages and methodologies and models and all the rest of it. And, uh, and I said, I think we need to encourage the consultants 
to meet, even though they were from different organizations, you know, the big five consulting organizations. And that met and, and have the discussion about why are they using different languages? Would it be beneficial for them to use the same language? Could they um, know what each other was doing in the organization without compromising their competitive position? Because it would be we were paying them, it would benefit the organization. And that meant that met with huge resistance. They said, you can't get competitor firms in the same room discussing the same topic, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, we're going to lose a lot of benefit if we don't. Let me just try it once and we'll see what happens. Anyway, to cut a long story short, because that took ages and ages to kind of get the go ahead. Um, we had all the consultants in the room, different organizations from the big five consulting companies outlined the problem. They all loved the discussion. They could immediately see the benefit if they started to work without compromising their competitiveness or giving away any secrets or anything into the same language and methodology and what have you. And it would benefit not just them, but us as the clients. And the upshot of that was that we had written into subsequent um, service level agreements with these consulting companies that they must use the same language and terminology and methodologies. And I think if you can prove, which saved a lot of money then, and a lot of confusion and what have you, I think that if you can prove an organizational benefit, you know, and all service designers have a kind of giant benefits list or project managers, what benefits are we going to realize? If you couch that in your, I want to start a movement, here are the organizational benefits, you might well get support. The, th the thing is, what you then hit is, so long as it doesn't take any time off the job. Um, and that, that can also be a bit of a stumbling block, but it doesn't need to take time off the job because you can have the conversations kind of within the job. Mm. It, it doesn't need to be hugely in initially intensive while you're just sounding things out. And particularly now we're all on Slack or Teams or any of these collaborative things. Uh, I the the objection of the fact that we that operation needs to keep running uh, that's that's like the classic one and I don't think we'll have uh, enough time to dig into that uh, today but one thing um, that inspired me while you were sharing the story about the big five is um, with every step you take uh, uh, to nudge the organization in a different direction i think you should also be thinking about how to embed this into the existing structure so that something actually sticks if you're gone and i think that's um often overseen and i'm curious if you also see the need for that so if we start a movement if we start a community or even a slack channel that's uh quite organic and uh, there's a lot of passion and energy for it, but it's all also very prone to evaporate and disappear over the next day if it's not captured in, in some form of organizational structure. That is correct. And I have seen that happen. And I've also seen it not happen and continue. And that's where I think there's a good um, intersect between the informal movement element to sort of informality and then how do you know when to formalize something and you see it that's a di completely different context but in startups you know they begin with 10 people all doing everything and then they suddenly when they reach 15 they think oh maybe we need to formalize some of this stuff and that question about when do you try and start to formalize it becomes quite important and i think the um that's one of the things i'm going to pick up in the final episode of the O'Deal blog that I'm writing, the fourth episode, of, of what, what is a good point to formalize something that is organic and, and informal? And, and then how do you formalize it? Is it through incentives? Is it through a role? Is it through a taxonomy? Is it through um, policies? There are all sorts of possibilities for formalizing something which, which have long, longevity. Um, or, you know, longer than the being vested in the person, which is another reason when I'm doing organization design work, I have a mantra of 
designed for the role, not the person. You can't ever assume the person is going to stay. You can make a bit of an assumption that the role will persist in some way. But even that doesn't always happen. So thinking about if you want to keep the movement and the what have you going, what needs to what part of it needs to keep going? Is it is it the formal elements or is it the informal um, get togethers and what have you? And often it's different things. You know, you need you might need a policy to formalize something. And that policy works without the informal elements supporting it then. So it, it depends on the context, but I think there are ways of doing it. And, and uh, if I look at myself, I wouldn't have the vocabulary or the toolkit or the methods to formalize things. Uh, those are just things that haven't crossed my mind. And I'm sure that there are many resources out there uh, that might be helpful for this. To be honest, I, I feel that we are scratching the surface in this conversation. And there we, uh, we've we touched on so many different topics that would deserve their own uh, episode and uh, maybe uh, we'll uh, need to make a sequel for this. Uh, but Naomi, to sort of start wrapping up, I'm curious if you had to recommend a few resources for people who want to dig into this topic a little bit more, what would be a few that are top of your mind? Well, <laughs> of course, I'm going to recommend my book, sure. um, th which is coming out, as I said, in January. But the, the I wrote a blog called the, the Toolkit of Toolkits, um, which is a, a sort of compendium. I think there are 23 toolkits mentioned in it. And it depends on what your background is. But but what I'm, I think is a cons kind of consistent thing that service designers, any person in the design field, um, would benefit from is a, a, a short course on systems thinking. How do you think about an organization as a whole system? And what is the value of systems? And that is beginning to merge, but it's a bit more um, complex than that, is complexity thinking about emergence. Um, and so if you've got a grounding in systems thinking and you've got massive curiosity and keep asking questions, um, then you can go quite a long way. And also, if you don't box yourself in, you don't need to think of yourself as a service designer. You could think of yourself as a designer. And if you just cast your eye down the list of other designers in your organization and meet them for coffee and say, what do you design and how do you design it? And, um, <clears throat> and there's a vast plethora of information around design thinking, which you sort of expands the field of service design. And, and thinking of your own specificity, which is of your own specific discipline, is of immense value. So don't lose that. But if you seat it in a broader landscape, you might get more personal benefit and be able to extend your own range a bit. I, I would totally agree. And I've got some ideas around that uh, that I'll be sharing in the coming weeks. Uh, Naomi, uh, just a final question before we wrap off, because I know uh, you have other things to do as well. How would you summarize this conversation? That's a good question. Well, well, it's been a very nice reflection for me of some of the aspects of my career, which I found um, intriguing and curious and, and a very good um, guidance. And thank you for that. Of some fascinating questions, which I agree, you know, are, are constantly on the top of my mind and are not immediately solvable with easy answers. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, thank you for coming on. Thank you for bringing in your perspective, your experience over the last years. Um, I wish we could continue. Like I said, maybe we'll try to do a sequel uh, for now. Again, thank you for coming to the service design community. Hopefully many people will be inspired by this episode and uh, look up some of those resources that you recommended. Okay, thanks very much. I've really enjoyed it myself. What's your biggest takeaway from this conversation? I'd love to know. So make sure you leave a comment down below. And if you don't want to miss any future episodes, make sure to click that subscribe button. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Service Design Show and I'll see you in the next video.